Thank you, Jay. Yeah. That, was, that was even longer than my presentation, I think. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like a 30 years experience from what you're reading. <laughs> Good morning, everyone, and thank you again for the invitation. I'm really happy to be here. I think it's my third conference this year, or second or third, and it's always a pleasure. Um, so Jane started a session today talking about how important it is that we have evidence to uh, the interventions that we developed, and today we're talking about digital interventions. And then Angela also approached a bit about how we need to conduct systematic reviews and have good evidence before we develop our interventions and following the systematic development based on behavioral science. Um, and the project that I'm going to talk about is a project focusing on the evidence aspect. So the Human Behavior Change Project that is being developed at UCL is a project trying to provide um, better ways of synthesizing the data that is available and helping policymakers, researchers, practitioners on using that evidence to develop more effective um, and more uh, relevant interventions for the real world. Um, so I'm going to very briefly address the problem that we face in terms of evidence. Uh, then I'm going to address what is the main purpose of the Human Behavior Change Project with a focus on the work that we do as behavioral scientists and how we collaborate with computer scientists and systems architects to be able to provide this project. Um, so the primary goal on any behavioral science that we are doing is to try to actually answer um, this big question that you see out there. So every time we develop an intervention, we apply an intervention, we are trying to understand uh, when it comes to behavior change interventions, what works, so what are the interventions that actually have an effect, and we can of course discuss what an effect means. Um, compared with what, so having a control group or a comparison arm, for what behaviors and different interventions might have different impacts on um, the behaviors that we are talking about, how well it works, which means the magnitude of the effect, for how long, with whom, the target population, in what setting, and Jane addressed the importance of context when we're thinking about um, interventions and why. And why is trying to understand the key mechanisms of action, the key theoretical constructs that can explain why an intervention uh, designed, for example, to improve physical activity has its effects. It can be through goals, through improving motivation, through decreasing fear, etc. Um, when we think about answering this big question or parts of this big question, we have a lot of challenges. And one of the first challenges that we have is that we do have a lot of papers being published every day looking at behavioral science and looking at behavioral change interventions and increasing daily in the digital world. But the problem is that there is a lot of inconsistency in terms of the reporting that is done. So a lot of the results from our research are um, quite heterogeneous. So we have interventions with higher effects, interventions with very low effects. And sometimes when we look at intervention, they look exactly the same. But when we start looking at the reporting, we do find that there are differences. And sometimes the way that interventions are described because they don't use a common language, uh, makes it quite difficult to understand what we have in terms of evidence. So a key challenge is how inconsistent and incomplete reporting is at the moment. And we have been having a lot of um, advances in this field, trying to develop guidelines for reporting, trying to develop taxonomies such as the behavior change techniques taxonomy, or frameworks such as the behavior change wheel that try to promote a systematic and common language. Um, and what we feel is that we can give a step forward and try to classify all of this content and features of behavior change interventions in ontologies. And I'm going to explain what ontologies are uh, a bit later on my talk. Um, the other aspect is that we have um, hundreds of papers being published every day and reports being submitted online, um, and it's really difficult for humans to be able to keep up to date with all the evidence that is published every day. And when we conduct systematic reviews and meta-analysis, and I, I suppose that many of you here in this room have that experience, it takes us one year, two years to publish our systematic reviews and meta-analysis, and sometimes when it gets out there in journals, it's already outdated, and we have to do an update to our meta-analysis because we have papers that were done one year and a half before. Um, so we, we do have a problem of being really difficult to keep up to date with, with evidence, so when we're trying to develop interventions, going back to 
what we have in terms of what works for that behavior takes a long time. So using automated extraction features can help with that and I'll explain how that will work in this project. Um, and then, um, as I mentioned a bit before, there is a lot of contra contradiction in terms of the results that we have in behavioral change interventions, differences in context, and it's quite complicated and complex, the amount of features and variable that are in place when we develop a digital um, behavior change intervention. Um, so trying to use machine learning and reasoning algorithms can help to evidence, to synthesize this evidence and actually provide uh, new insights insights and prediction to, to behavior change. So based on these challenges and looking at three potential solutions, uh, we developed the Human Behavior Change Project. Uh, the Human Behavior Change Project is led by Professor Susan Miki at UCL, and it's funded by the Wellcome Trust. Um, and it's a four years project, and it's a collaboration between UCL, uh, Mary Johnson at the University of Aberdeen, colleagues in the University of, of Cambridge, Mike Kelly, um, other colleagues at UCL from the Epicenter, and IBM Research. So IBM is developing all the computer scientist aspects of this project. Um, as you can see here, this is a collaboration between different teams, and I'm going to address a bit how this collaboration works. Um, and um, we are a big team, and we continue to grow and continue to have collaborations and other people involved. Um, so as I said before, the key problem that we have is messy evidence growing faster than what humans can keep up with. And what we want to get, and what is our purpose when we use evidence, is to have estimates of the effect of our interventions, and we can discuss what effect means depending on the outcomes that we are looking at. Uh, we want to understand the reasons why some interventions work, others don't work, or work for different behaviors or different people. And we want to be able to generate new hypotheses. We want to be able to ask new questions and ask new, um, new, have new ideas of how certain theories might work or what are the key mechanisms of action, uh, what might be in place that can justify and advance behavioral science. Um, and in the Human Behavior Change Project, the way that we go from this messy um, evidence to having an organized evidence that provides these new insights is using artificial intelligence, natural language processing, machine learning techniques. And this is informed by an ontology, uh, which is a classification system that provides and organizes the structure for the machine learning and the artificial intelligence techniques being able to operate. So what we are building in a human behavior change project is a behavior change intervention. So BCI is behavior change intervention knowledge system. So what you see in the left side is that we have a series of evaluation reports. And at the moment, we are mainly using studies from Cochrane reviews, because these are studies that um, have already been uh, scrutinized in terms of their quality. Um, this studies and uh, evaluating these studies will then inform the annotations or the coding of the studies that we are doing, automated and manual, and I'll explain that after. Um, this information goes to our database, and the database has the extraction information from the papers, and it's organized within our ontology. Then it comes to place the work of the computer scientists that using these algorithms are going to make predictions and inferences from the data that we extracted. And this is all available in what we call the Human Behavior Change Project interface, in which users can ask different kinds of queries about behavior change interventions. So I can go and ask for sun protection, um, what is the evidence in terms of mobile interventions, or for a teenage population, or for older adult population, which mobile intervention is better to promote um, higher engagement with sun uh, protection among holidaymakers, for example, just to use Angela's example. Um, so the first part and the key aspect the behavioral scientists are developing is the behavior change interventions ontology. So an ontology can be represented as you see here, and an ontology is a representation of our knowledge. So we have all of these entities, the circles that you see there, and we establish relationships between those circles. Um, so some of you probably heard about taxonomies, which are also ways of classifying the information uh, in a hierarchical structure. The ontology allows for more dynamic relations. So you can still have taxonomies within the ontology, but we are saying here is that 
um, aspects such as the delivery of the intervention or the content of the intervention can have relationships with engagement, with reach, with the behavior, with the outcome, so it's more dynamic. Um, what you see in the left side of this ontology are the entities related with a study, so with a randomized controlled trial in this case, related with how we compare, the effect, aspects of risk of bias, and what you see on the right side are the elements related with a behavior change intervention scenario, so the entire content of a behavior change intervention. And I'm going to show you this in a triangle that it's easier to see. So this is another way of representing what we have in a behavior change intervention. Um, and the hypothesis and what we are saying is that the effects of an intervention in a given outcome um, result from the interaction between different behavior change intervention features. So when we want to make inferences and when we want to uh, be able to get evidence for what works in a behavior change intervention, we need to look at the content. We need to look at the black box that we have within interventions. So what we are saying here is that interventions have a content which we describe as behavior change techniques, are the techniques that are the strategies that we implement to um, change behavior. They have different modes of delivery, so they can be delivered through an app, through text message, through email, uh, through an audio call, face-to-face -face interventions, etc. cetera. Um, there are mechanisms of action, and these are the environmental and uh, the motivational and cognitive and emotional aspects that can explain how a given technique will have their effect, for example, through self-efficacy. Then we have aspects of reach and engagement with the intervention, aspects of the context, population and setting, and all of this interacts to provide a given effect size, which is what you see as a result of an intervention. So you see a comparison between two groups and an effect size that actually results from all of this. So what we are trying to do is classify each of these features. And ontologies help us not only to classify, but also to be able to use a language that different disciplines understand. So when we talk about ontologies, computer scientists know what we are talking about, systems architects know what we are talking about, and different disciplines understand what we are talking about. It also helps us have a more clarity in our thinking and reporting, because everything is defined with clear labels, clear definitions that have certain rules, and clear relationships. So this is what we are trying to do at the moment. Um, for modes of delivery and behavior change techniques, we have already developed um, the, the lower level ontologies. For target population intervention setting, we are doing that at the moment. For target behavior mechanisms of action, uh, we are under development, so earlier stages. And source, reach, and engagement, we are still in the conceptualization stage. And this is a four years project. We have started, um, it's going to be two years in September. Um, and this shows how long it takes to develop these ontologies. For those of you that are familiar with the behavior change techniques taxonomy, uh, it was a project that took many years um, to, to be able to be implemented. And the same happened. So what we are doing is basically the same that what was done for the behavior change techniques taxonomy, but for all the other features. Um, so for modes of delivery, we have around 70 entities. We also have around 55 entities for setting. So each of these features that you see there have a lot of entities that we develop using a systematic procedure. So at the moment, we are only looking at RCTs for smoking cessation interventions on Cochrane reviews. Um, and then we are going to do the same for alcohol consumption, physical activity, and dietary behaviors. But the idea is that this is a starting point. Once, once the system is working, then it can be applied for a variety of behaviors within the health context, outside the health context also. I'm not going to get into the steps of the ontology development, uh, but I just wanted to draw the attention that this is a systematic procedure that we start with reviewing everything that is out there from other classification systems for any discipline to identify, for example, definitions of population and parameters of population. And then we go through an initial screen of the literature to identify if these parameters actually <coughs> appear in these papers and if the papers have information that we are missing. So this is our first annotation test, if you want to call it like that. 
Then we go and we work on the ontology, we develop the structure, the definitions, we have experts that are involved, and once we have that, we continue to annotate and doing manual annotations for 300 papers at the moment in smoking cessation, and we'll have more um, for, for, um, for the other behaviors. Um, and this annotation procedure is done manually from our side, and then IBM is developing the automatic annotations, and one aspect of the inter-rated reliability will be to um, cross-check um, the, the manual annotations and the automatic annotations until we have a good level of confidence to say that we can continue to do it automatic instead of needing to do it manually. So this is just another way of representing what I was just saying. We have the papers, we did the extraction of the papers that hopefully will be automatic even a certain, once we achieve a certain level of confidence on um, the algorithms that are being built by IBM. Uh, we then use the, our ontology to structure all of this information and this will lead to analytics that have inferences and recommendations. So based on the 500 papers that are available for all of these features, this is the level of evidence that we have, the level of confidence, this is what you should use, or level of, our level of confidence is too low and there's nothing we can infer from this, which, which can happen with certain behaviors and populations, of course. Um, so one important thing here, and the reason why I put this slide, is that every time we are annotating for data manual, we are meeting with the IBM team to discuss what we are doing. So we develop an entire code set and if you think about the triangle that I just showed, for each of these features we have a code set. So we can have a code set with 600 codes or entities and we extract information from all the papers and then we meet weekly with the IBM team to discuss how the information that we are extracting is useful, um, questions that they have, how we can um, improve the way that we're extracting that information because the purpose is that the information that we are extracting is useful for um, providing algorithms. So we are not thinking of this as a typical systematic review where we have a lot of human interpretation when we are extracting and coding and discussing. We are thinking of what is exactly in the paper that we can provide. And just as an example, we use a epi reviewer as a software. What you see in the left side is the code set. This is just an example of a code set. We have a PDF of the paper. And then we code what this PCT is, for example, self-monitoring of behavior. Then we indicate where the text this is and all the evidence. And the evidence is the full sentence. And the evidence is quite important to develop the algorithms because the system, the automatic system, um, through unsupervised learning, will I use this evidence to be able to identify on its own what's in the reports. Um, so our challenges so far uh, developing the ontology has been raising a lot of technical methods and, of course, philosophical issues. What do we really want from this ontology? Um, are we capturing everything that we need to capture? Is this a representation of the world? Is this a representation of theories? Uh, different disciplines approach ontologies on different ways. So we have been facing these challenges and especially thinking about what is the best method to develop an ontology in our field. Um, we have, and um, uh, one of our colleagues in the project, Emma Norris, has just submitted a paper Paper, uh, looking at a scoping review of ontologies um, and there are um, a lot of ontologies in, our, in other fields but in our field in behavior change there is, a, there is almost nothing. So to develop the method of the ontology we have to um, we had to start from the beginning and we have to develop this entire process and that has been quite a challenge. Of course, we do have ontologists that work with us and help us with that. The other aspect is the complexity of levels. You're going to be listening to different interventions developed in, uh, during the day and Angela just presented on um, an intervention that was developed systematically and Angela mentioned a few times the limitations, the difficulties, the challenges and what happens in behavior change interventions is that we have a complexity of levels. Different levels, different actors involved, different populations, scenarios. The way that things are reported is really messy. So one of our problems when we are doing the annotations is 
being sure that we are annotating the right information and trying to define what is the confidence from this learned knowledge. And this is a really, um, a really hard uh, question to resolve, but it's fundamental because if this project is going to provide evidence on what to do when you face a given problem, you need to have confidence on the evidence that you are providing. And then the ambiguities in the information provided. So a lot of reports, especially all the reports, um, are very, very poor in terms of the language that is used um, and even trying to classify behavior change techniques. Sometimes the information is so vague that it's quite difficult for us to understand. Um, with these challenges, we are working with the computer scientists and the systems architects to be able to tackle these issues. Um, so as I mentioned before, one way that we have to actually work together well is having consensus agreed methods and procedures between the different disciplines so we all agree with the language that we're using, with the procedures that we're using and it works in that way um, and it's always an iterative process so we keep on going back and forth in terms of our discussions and what we want to get. And even things very simple such as um, coding for age or annotating for age, um, for us it's very obvious to just have the age there and the mean, uh, but when you talk with our colleagues um, they need to know what that, what that number refers to because if they don't have what is the code for that number they can't um, provide um, the automated information for that. Um, the other aspect that is really, really crucial is that you need a lot of time for this project. This is a four years project and this is a project that we are very lucky that Welcome Trust uh, really promotes a project that is risky, it's challenging, it's um, cutting edge, it's very innovative because we need time. We need time to read what is an ontology, uh, what is machine learning, what does artif artificial intelligence do. So we go into disciplines that aren't our discipline to understand what the other colleagues are thinking and what they are doing and to be able to provide the best ontology um, possible. And then of course learn from these other disciplines and be involved with teams that you say well actually this other team they are really amazing, they are so good, I can learn from them um, and you feel that you're, you're really gaining from the other team that you are working with and I think that makes things much easier across disciplines. Um, this is a recent blog that was posted by Sherry Pagode. I think Sherry was here in one of the conferences, right? And yeah, and Eric Eckler. And I just put this information here. If you want to read, it's available on Twitter and um, online. But this idea in the digital health that we need to embrace what we call the transdisciplinarity. And it's not this idea that being in a digital world is behavioral science or is computer science or is system architect or is software development, whatever you, is the discipline involved, um, it's the different disciplines that have to work together. Because if you don't do that, you're not tackling the problem. And the Human Behavior Change Project is a really good example of, of this situation. So just to end, um, this environment, this multidisciplinary environment and being able to learn and to experience uh, from other groups allows the development of these projects and is essential in addressing our problems. We wouldn't have um, a good behavior change intervention ontology or a classification system if we weren't working with our colleagues in IBM and Epicenter. Um, the Human Behavior Change Project will enable researchers to identify what they need and to be able to assess um, evidence that is up to date in real time with more precision and speed. Um, and this system will be an open system that other researchers can use to apply to other behaviors and to apply to other domain. And for us, this is essential. It's not our research team that is going to answer all the problems in the world. We do want this to go out there and to be used and collaborate. And just to end, as part of these collaborations that we have with the NICE guidelines, with Cochrane, with other groups, one of the projects that I'm actually going to be leading at the moment, sorry, it's a project looking at personalization of digital intervention, so developing an ontology just for personalization and work with colleagues at IBM and in a PROACT project that is being developed in Trinity College to see how behavioral change science and our models can help to personalize better um, interventions in digital healthcare. So the protocol of our paper and all the information is available here and our website has all the resources available so every time we have a document that is ready it goes to open science framework and the entire um, scientific community can have access to it. Thank you.